Hello, I'm Past Paper Guy. I'm going to be solving this Physics AS Paper 2 uh, 2016 for you. Um, as with all my videos, what I would suggest you do is you go and look at the link below, find the paper from the AQA website and have a look at it and give it a go yourself first and then use this video in order to help you with some of the finer points. Question one practical question. The first question here is asking can you read a vernier scale? So everything was lined up at zero here so we need to read this vernier scale here. So first of all you look at this side to find the number of millimeters it is. So it's where this lines up with here so it's uh, more than one millimeter, more than two millim millimeters but less than three so it's two point something. So it's two point something there and then we look to see which one of these lines up with one of these and we go down and it's that one there that I think lines up most closely and so that one is seven so there are one two three four five six seven so it's 2.7 so 2.7 millimeters figure two shows how delta L varies with M uh, determine the mass for our 2.7 millimeters. So we need to find 2.7 to start with, so that's 2.5. Each two little squares is 0.1, so it's going to be there. So we've put our ruler on there. We draw a line across there. And then from where we hit there, down to there. So that's the value there, which is 5.8. 5.8 there. So 5.8 kilograms belongs there. Continuing with question one then. So here we have some calipers, they're digital calipers. Uh, but you'll notice when you put them to um, shut here, there's a zero error on. So this result here has the zero error. So in order to get rid of a zero error, we need to take it away from our result. So we've got 0.44 take away minus 0.07, which gives you 0.51 millimeters. Okay, next we are determining the Young's modulus of the metal. So we've got all of the different pieces now. Young's modulus. is equal to the stress divided by the strain. So we need to work out each of those individual bits. So the stress of something is the weight of it, the force on it, which was, uh, which is mg, divided by the cross-sectional area. And we need to divide that by the strain, which is the change in length divided by the original length. Okay, so this formula here, where does it come from? Well, we're using Young's modulus equals tensile stress over tensile strain. The stress is the force divided by the area. Well, the force is going to be the weight of the thing that's been added divided by its cross-sectional area, and the strain is change in length divided by the original length there. Okay, so we've got quite a big calculation now. So first of all, we need to put in the weight, which was 5.8 kilograms times by 9.81, uh, which is acceleration due to gravity. We then divide that by the cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area is pi r squared. So pi times by the radius was this divided by two. So 0.51 times 10 to the minus three divided by two and we need to square that. And then we need to divide that whole thing by the change in length, which was 2.7 times 10 to the minus three, that's from the previous question, which was there, 2.7 millimeters. Um, at, and that in turn is divided by the original length, which is written there, 1.82. So that's a big calculation. You can do it in multiple steps. I'm going to see if I can put it all in in, uh, in a few separate steps just to break it down. So 
5.8 times by 9.81, so that's the top bit there. Then I'm going to divide that by pi times by this squared, so 0.15 times 10 to the minus 3 squared. Oh, I need to divide that by 2. Divided by 2 squared. So that's, I've worked out that bit now. And then I need to divide it by this fraction here, 2.7 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 1.82, which gives me this value here. Press the ENG button to get it into useful units, which is a few giga, uh, hundreds of gigapascals, which is kind of what you want. So that's equal to 187.7475 dot dot dot. Uh, times 10 to the 9, so it is 1, 8, 8 times 10 to the 9 pascals to three significant figures. I think we can, we either want to give that answer to two or three significant figures looking at our previous data. I suppose that's in two significant figures, so maybe two would have been better there. But either way. The student repeats her experiment using a wire of the same length but a smaller diameter. Discuss two ways in which the change might, might change the percentage uncertainty in the result. Right. So there are two things which will be affected if you change the diameter. The first is the cross-sectional area. The second is the change in length. So let's do the cross-sectional area first. Um, because the diameter is smaller, that means you'll have a larger percentage of uncertainty in measurement of diameter. Because the diameter is smaller, there will be a larger percentage uncertainty in the measurement of the diameter. Therefore, and diameter squared, A is proportional to diameter squared there. Um, so therefore, we have double that percentage uncertainty added to the percentage uncertainty of Young's modulus. As Young should have a capital Y, really, shouldn't he? Okay, so that's the first factor. The second thing is it will affect this. If you make the wire thinner, then for the same weight, it will stretch more. That will reduce the percentage uncertainty in the measurement of delta L. So uh, the wire will stretch more, which will reduce the percentage uncertainty in the measurement of delta L and so reduce the uncertainty of Young's modulus. So that's question one. Question two, we've got some information here about this experimental setup. Now, this is one of these questions where it's not really important what's going on in the experiment here. What's more important is how you can process the data and use the techniques that you've learned to do that. So don't panic when you see an experiment like this, which is completely different to anything that you've done and you don't understand what's going on in it. It doesn't matter. Um, and they're going to show, they're going to throw something like this at you, uh, whatever. Okay, so firstly, we need to plot the corresponding points, uh, this one and this one. So this is not entirely straightforward. The graph doesn't have the nicest of scales, um, but the first one is going to be at 258. So 258 is halfway between there and there. 
So we're going to be that way on the, that axis, and it's going to be 450, so it's going to be exactly on the line there, which means it's going to be there. Plot it with a nice cross when you're plotting your points. And then the next one is 298. So again, we're going to be halfway between that bit and that bit. And then we want 1,456. So the, the jump between there and there is 50. So each little box is 5. So each little box there is 5. So we want one little box and a tiny, tiny bit. So that's one little box and a tiny, tiny bit leaves me with that. Draw a suitable best fit line. Okay, so this is tricky best fit line to do. So the first thing you do is you move the paper so that you are on the inside of the curve. So we're going to have a curve that's going to go up around like that and down like that. Okay, you practice a couple of times and you're going to have to do this in stages. So you might need more than one attempt at it. You don't have to go through all the points, but you do have to go close to every single point when you're doing it. Okay. Okay, so we've put the best fit line in there. I think I could have done it slightly better at the top there, but I think it's okay. Determine the maximum value of the, the EMF. So get your, find the peak, which for me is almost exactly on that line. Draw a horizontal line across like so. Yep. And then we need to read off this value. So each of these is five, so that's 55, 60, 65, one, four, six, five. Maybe one less than that, so maybe one, four, six, four, I think is what I'm gonna go for, because it's slightly below that line there. Uh, one, four, six, four goes there. So two part four, the gradient of the graph here can be measured and plotted on this figure here. So here we have a positive gradient, so that's up here, um, and the gradient gets flatter and flatter and flatter until it's eventually zero, which is there, and then it becomes negative as it goes down like that. So that's what we're plotting here. We're finding the gradients of this graph, we're plotting it here. The neutral temperature is the temperature corresponding to the maximum value of E there. It can be determined using either this figure or this figure. Explain why a more accurate result of this can be obtained by this figure here. Well, the advantage of this figure here is that, uh, well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the maximum value here, which is where it's horizontal. So that means the gradient is zero. So for this figure here, we can just read off gradient equals zero. So on figure two, oh sorry, on figure six, um, we can read off the maximum value where it corresponds to gradient equals zero. So what is that? That's 280 degrees Celsius. Okay, which is pretty much where we did actually get on this one here. Um, whereas, but we've got to make a comparison because we've got to say why more accurate. So we've got to go back to this one as well. But on figure five, it, it's a little bit harder to draw this bit here than it is to draw those bits there and there. Where exactly is the peak? Could it have gone a bit higher? Could it have gone a bit lower? Um, it is harder to draw the peak. And so judgment call comes in. Uh, 
as to the exact maximum. So here we can measure the gradients here, 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 and here, and plot them, and it will, the line will slice through the zero point there. Whereas here we have to find, we have to judge exactly where that peak is. So that's the reason why um, this one's easier than this one. This one has a judgment decision on, this one doesn't. It can be shown that g is given by this equation here, so that's the same as y equals mx plus c, isn't it? So we can make those things correspond. So theta is being plotted there. That's that, and m is that. So determine a. So a is going to be the y-intercept. Okay, but unfortunately we don't have a y-intercept here because it starts at 220. We need to go all the way back to zero. So we need to do this mathematically instead. So first of all, we need to work out what the gradient is. So the gradient beta is equal to the change in y divided by change in x. So let's pick some easier values for us to figure. So that one's a relatively easy value, and it certainly covers enough of the graph. And we'll also pick just the very bottom here, I think. Okay, so that's going to be so delta G there is the difference between there and there, and delta theta there. So we've got delta G over delta theta, which is going to equal, right, um, so it's final value minus start value. So that value there is minus 3.6 minus the start value, which is 1.5, isn't it, 1.5, divided by final value, 380 minus the start value, 240 there. So that is going to equal some value. So we've got minus 3.6 minus 1.5 divided by that, which is 140, isn't it? Gives us negative and it's obvious that it's negative gradient, it's sloping down, 0 0.0364 dot dot dot, like that. Right, now we need to work out what this value of alpha is. So when g is equal to 0, theta is equal to, g is equal to 0, theta is equal to 280. You could pick any value there that you liked from the graph, but that's just the easiest one to pick. So now we can now just feed all of this into the equation. So we have um, g is equal to beta theta plus alpha. So we have 0 is equal to beta, which is minus 0 0.0364 dot 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 times by theta, which is 280 plus alpha so alpha is equal to that, which um, that was my gradient times by 280 gives me 10.2. Uh, so if I move that over there, it becomes positive. So alpha equals 10.2, 10.2. Uh, and they have given you the units, but it's the units of that divided by the units, oh no, it's the y-intercept, so it's just the units of that, sorry. Okay, question 2.6. Okay, so we've got a, an ammeter here, a galvanometer measuring very small currents here, and what they're suggesting is that by using this, because essentially it's a resistor, if you know the current through there, and you know its resistance, which is 1,000 ohms, then you can use V equals IR to work out the potential difference across that there. So it's a bit of an odd way of using um, an ammeter, uh, not a very good one because that's not going to be very reliable. 
So when this meter indicates its maximum deflection there, which is 100 microamps, uh, what's the voltage across it? Well, the V equals IR. So it's going to be 100 times 10 to the minus 6 times by 1000, which is the resistance. They want the answer out in microvolts, not in volts. So we'll leave our times 10 to the minus 6 there. So we've got 100,000 times 10 to the minus 6. So it's 100,000 microvolts there. The scale of the meter has 50 divisions, so little bits there, between 0 and a full-scale deflection. Discuss why it's not suitable for carrying out this experiment here. Well, let's find out what the resolution is. So the resolution of this is the full-scale deflection, 100,000, divided by the number of different things, which is equal to 2,000 microvolts per division, which is very, very bad, because the smallest reading that we want, or any of the readings that we want to take, is all smaller than one division. So all of the readings we need to make are smaller than one division on this meter. So it's a dreadful meter to use. So every single reading is going to be between there and there, which is pretty poor. Okay. Uh, so what's this question about? This question is about do you understand what resolution is? So the resolution is the full-scale deflection divided by the number of divisions that the thing is divided into.